When a story breaks, I mean, every reporter is expected to be ready to go. There are a few things that I have to have, and I never forget. One of them, obviously, is the, um, the passport, of which I've got four. <laughs> One of them's just got visas in it, and, uh, and then the three are um, just... If I have to get into places where um, they don't want journalists, it's a bit of a giveaway, because a lot of them have, you know, why would you be in Libya? <laughs> Not exactly a tourist spot at the moment. Flak jacket, which is really heavy to wear, I can tell you. 30, 30 pounds or so this way. So look, and, it, and it's heavy, but it's got protective um, plates at the front and back, which will save your life, basically. In Libya, for instance, something like a flak jacket and helmet, we were wearing virtually 24 7. I've been taking this Arab phrase book and copy of the Quran, because this could be my get out of jail book, basically, uh, when you're traveling in Muslim countries and they, they want to know that you're empathetic, if nothing else. I think that's essential and that often draws um, positive um, response from them. My kids say things like, why can't you be a dinner lady or something like that so that we can see you every day? I think it's hard for every parent when you go away. And I go away a lot, especially this year. Well, I was hoping to spend a bit of time at home when I got the call to go back to Libya. Well, Misrata was the next um, city that Gaddafi seemed to be focusing on, to crush, basically. The only way you could go in and out was via the sea, via the port, which they still had control of, but were constantly coming under attack. We heard Tim Hetherington, who's a very well-known British photographer, had been killed that night in Misrata. They were behind a wall as the rockets were coming in, and one of the um, one of the uh, rocket-propelled grenades hit the wall. And Tim was killed along with uh, another photographer. I know I definitely had um, lots of butterflies, and I was I could feel my adrenaline and my um, anxiety levels going up um, as we got closer. Okay, go. We turned up, and there were literally hundreds of these um, fighters. And I hadn't seen um, anything like it in Libya. How many of you are trained in using the guns? No How one. many? Anyone trained? No one. Anyone a soldier here? No one. Who, what, what does this man do before he, before he became a... Maintenance. Maintenance. Steel, steel worker. Engineer. Engineer. Uh, yourself? You're a doctor. So you can see a variety of different occupations, none of them apparently soldiers and with no training, if any training at all. Now they were like hardened soldiers. They were a little fighting force. Not so little, actually. This used to be Misrata's vegetable market. It's, it was occupied by about half a dozen, at least half a dozen tanks. This is actually the remnants of a T-72 Russian tank. It looks as though it was hit probably by a NATO strike. I'm not sure when, but it appears to be fairly recently. It hit with such force that the turret from the tank ended up over here. The Misrata Brigade were really on the up at that stage. They were just about to reclaim uh, the town and flush out the Gaddafi forces. They remained under siege for a lot longer, but they were, they were managing to push out the Gaddafi forces who were inside the town. Well, that is where the government forces were meant to have been hiding out. There's a massive amount of smoke and an awful lot of firing. Difficult to imagine how anyone can stay in there for much longer if they are indeed still alive.
The fighters in Misrata say this is no rebellion anymore. This is a battle for survival. They're also taking prisoners. The captured soldier looks terrified. He knows there are many here who want him dead. We were taken to see him away from the crowd because the crowd of fighters were very, were, were very bent on revenge. What were his instructions, his unit's instructions? Mm. What were they told to do? It's your door. The person in that matter lies. And look. Uh, they, 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 they ask him or they order him to, to stay there and don't leave anybody to live. To live, don't let anyone live. Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. The main street was absolutely trashed. There was uh, lots and lots of unexploded ordnance around. There was a lot of dead people around, so much so that they were having to fumigate the street because the smell was quite overpowering. But they were winning in Maserata. They were reclaiming the town. And I was thinking we should maybe dig in and stay there for the long term. So I'd sort of tried to persuade the guys that we'll, we'll just sit out the royal wedding and we'll stay in Misrata and we'll, you know, do whatever we can um, to try and break through the royal wedding frenzy and get some Misrata stories on. But then we heard that there was a ship um, leaving. It was like this massive rush for the ship. Um, and thousands and thousands of migrant workers who were sort of brought in on the backs of the um, trucks, uh, all absolutely desperate to get out, absolutely desperate. Everywhere we went, there were, <laughs> there were people watching the royal wedding in these um, road, roadside cafes. Um, it was really quite surreal, but there was quite a lot of interest in the royal wedding, even, even in all these countries which were in the middle of having their revolutions. <laughs> it's a love story that blossomed in private before being played out on that world stage. We reckon two billion people, you may be uh, part of all that worldwide, His Royal Highness Prince William of Wales marrying Kate Middleton, the middle-class girl next door, and now becomes a princess. My own family was obviously really um, interested in, well, not, they weren't particularly interested in the fact that it was a royal wedding. I think it was, it, it, there was a lot of interest in Kate's dress, my 11-year-old says. Um, Kate Middleton's so pretty, but who is the guy she's marrying? <laughs> the wedding parties weren't even over, and I don't think we'd even unpacked from Ms. Rata when the news came through from the White House. The United States has conducted an operation that killed Osama bin Laden, the leader of Al-Qaeda. Everyone thought he'd been living in a cave somewhere when really he'd been living right under the noses of the Pakistani military. There was security, no doubt. I mean, look at the height of these walls. It's got to be at least 12 foot, and no other house around here has walls that high. But, of course, it was housing the world's number one terrorist, the man that everyone in the world was apparently meant to be hunting, even uh, Pakistan. Now you can't get further than these gates now, and it has turned into quite a tourist attraction with the world's media and all the local residents all desperate to see and be close to this residence. Personally, though, I think one of the most shocking stories of the year was the hacking scandal. This Sunday will be the last issue of the News of the World. I'm live here at the News International headquarters in Wapping, and there's sadness as the staff prepare to put the final edition into print. Why on earth would you try to get into the phone of a poor schoolgirl who'd been murdered? I just felt really, really angry about it all. I thought it tarnished the whole profession.